Hey guys, my name is Jeff Rojas. I'm a commercial and editorial photographer based here in New York City. Uh, primarily what I shoot is editorial and fashion campaigns. So things that you would see on billboards, things that you would see in ma fashion magazines, and all the way through. Uh, prior to doing this, or doing commercial or fashion photography, I shot a lot of portraiture. And then prior to that, I picked up a camera to photograph cars initially, because I was restoring a 1964 Chevy Impala with my grandfather and wanted to document that process. That love for the car turned into the love for photography, and here I am today. Um, I started off taking classes the same way that you guys are here, learning from people like myself, uh, more or less what they were producing, their business methodology, their lighting methodology, and things that I can produce uh, on my own. So I took a little, curated a little bit from everybody that I learned and repurposed it for myself, uh, which is why I asked you guys before the class started, what do you guys want to learn? Because I don't remember a single time anyone's ever asked me that as I was sitting there in a class. They kind of just regurgitated information, except for Charles. Charles always does that. Uh, in terms of today's class, I really want to thank the Flat World for sponsoring the class. Uh, for those of you, we'll talk about the lighting segment a little later. The Flat World is an awesome company to, that creates collapsible V flats, things that you guys can pack away. Usually speaking, a V flat is about eight feet tall, four feet wide, very cumbersome, especially if you live here in New York City. These collapse very easily. I'll demonstrate that a little later. But these are an invaluable part of my, uh, my toolkit at the present moment. I live in about 500 square feet. The ability to pack these inside a small home studio. My home studio, by the way, is 60 square feet. So if I can put this over to a corner, I'm done, I'm golden. Um, if you guys want to see that video, go to YouTube, Google my name, look up 60 square feet, you'll see exactly the space that I'm shooting in. Um, all of that is free for you guys, and I'm creating a lot of content with B&H now uh, to share with you guys. So everything that I have for you guys today, again, is stuff that you can take home. I'm not asking you to buy anything by any means. Everything that we're talking about today is free. Um, I'm also an open book. Let's treat this like therapy. Any questions, comments, concerns that you guys have, let me know. That's what I'm here for, so open book. In terms of fashion photography, so the class today is Introduction to Fashion Photography. We'll talk about breaking into the fashion market. We'll talk about shooting from magazines. We'll talk about reaching out to paid clients. We'll talk about um, how to publish those specific things, the differences between submission versus commission, finding a team, and all of that. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you already have creatives that you already work with or work alongside? Can you raise your hands for me? Also, one person. How many of you are interested in being a fashion photographer or potentially just shooting fashion for fun? Can you raise your hands with me? OK, awesome. The reason I ask that is because as a fashion photographer or somebody who shoots fashion, you can't do it alone. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There are people who do that OK, but they don't do it really well. If you look at most uh, traditional fashion photographers or the high level ones, your Annie Leibowitz, your Mark Seliger, and those folks, you have people that have creative teams that work for them. They have a stylist, they have a makeup artist, they have a wardrobe stylist, they have assistants on set, they have everyone in regards to get this job done. So ultimately, they have a creative team to put that together. You guys at the present moment, starting off, don't have that, and that's okay. But it's very easy to reach out to people. So this is the first thing I always want you guys to remember before anything else, before starting this class. Photography, your work, has value. When I say value, what I mean is this. What you create, somebody needs. What you create is valuable to someone else. So as an example, if I asked you, would you spend $250,000 on a car? Maybe. Maybe. Would you spend $250,000 on a car? Nope. nope. Would you spend? No. So everybody looks at that difference as, as value. You might see that as the most valuable car in the world. Charles might say, I like that car because it takes me from A to B, and it's, it's $3,000, and that's worth it to me. Everybody has a different opinion on what's valuable. And the thought process behind that is, as a photographer, you have to understand what your clients deem as valuable. So the analogy that I give everybody, or the example I give everyone is, if you were a photographer photographing portraits for, let's say, uh, business professionals, what's that worth to them? And I'll give you guys an example, perfect example. A dentist. How many, how many people love going to the dentist? <laughs> two? I love this. So two people love going to the dentist. The reason I mention that is, if you have a toothache, and your usual dentist is completely out of the office because they're busy for the next week, and it is excruciatingly painful, what do you go do? Do you wait for the week, or do you go online to go look for someone? You look for someone, right? And how do you look for somebody in 2019? You Google them, right? And then what do you see? You see websites and photos. What happens if somebody has a scary looking photo and they don't look approachable, they look like somebody that you don't want to go to their dentist's office? You don't want to go, right? Like That's not something you want to do. Now, think about the value of that. That image dissuaded you from going to that specific client, or that specific doctor, rather. Right? What happens if 20 people did that a month? What happens if 50 people did that a month? What happens if 100 people did that every single month? How does that affect that 
uh, dentist's top line revenue or what their, their income is. It affects it every single month. So the reason I mention that is as a photographer, if you can take a beautiful image of a dentist that let's say nobody wants to go to, you can directly influence the amount of people that are, going to, that are going to go to their business and you have a ton more value. So in that case, what's a client worth to a dentist? Let's say a regular cleaning, 150 bucks, all the way to something that's substantial at $1,500, $2,500, $3,000. Think of how many new, new revenue that you're bringing to that specific dentist. The reason I mention that is if you can impact that person and even bring in five new clients for that year with that one photograph, why are you charging 50 bucks for a headshot? Does that make sense to everybody? You shouldn't be charging $50 for the headshot. The value is that you're producing something. The reason I mention that in fashion photography before we start is that when I think of you guys creating, I want you to remember that you guys have valuable things that you're creating, regardless of who you're working with. If I reach out to a makeup artist, let's say, and she's like, hey, my day rate's 750 bucks, and she's just starting her portfolio, and I'm just starting my portfolio, why am I paying her when she's also starting her portfolio? It should be some sort of camaraderie. We should be able to create something together because she's ultimately benefiting from the same thing that I'm benefiting. If I can create images that she can use to market her business or he can use to market his business, why am I paying that specific person? So ultimately, what I'm telling you guys is you should find people to collaborate with that cost you zero dollars and zero cents, people that are interested in working with you towards a specific initiative. And as you start growing your team and as you start growing, growing your clientele, then you start paying your people. Does that make sense to everybody? So very candidly, as I first started off in fashion photography, I never paid a makeup artist, I never paid a wardrobe stylist, I never played a, um, a prop stylist because I was looking for people that are also trying to create their new portfolio because I was working with people that are now building something and they wanted to, to have an end result. So the reason I mention that to you guys is your photography has value, but they're also expecting something in return. So this is going to kind of be a point home that's going to hit some, some of you very hard. I don't copyright my images for them because they were equally a part of the process to create the image. I expect them, if they're going to put it on social media, to tag me on those specific posts, but I'm not going to watermark their whole image across an image because ultimately they're reaching out to different brands. They also worked on set that whole day and worked their behinds off to be part of that process. So it's not worth my time watermarking something. But I do expect them to tag that and I also uh, explain where that image can be utilized. So if they, they can use it on social media, they can use it on Instagram, yes, but you have to tag me. I need to be tagged in that specific post so people know that I did that. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Hairstylist, makeup artist, hairstylist, makeup artist, wardrobe stylist. Hairstylist, as an example, what you're looking for, and just being very candid, it's 2019, but I'm going to be very direct. Not everyone can cut everyone's hair. I'm going to say that again. Not everyone can cut everyone's hair. And I say that because I'm Hispanic. There's no way that anybody's touching my mom's hair unless they know how to speak, work with Hispanic hair. It's a very specific thing. Anybody who's Caribbean or knows anything about the Caribbean, we don't, we, don't touch, we don't let anybody touch our hair unless they know what they're doing. Men as well, we don't let anybody touch our hair unless they know what they're doing. There are specific people that are great at specific things. There are people that are great at coloring. There are great pe that, uh, people that are great at working, let's say, with um, Asian hair or Hispanic hair or black hair. There are a ton of people that are really good at certain things. If you're photographing for a certain publication, find the person that's really good at that specific thing. Because you don't want to grab somebody and then do, let's say, prom hair and you're trying to get into L magazine. Because it just doesn't look right. L hair does not look good in, in, sorry, prom hair does not look good in L, for example. Prom hair, generally speaking, is not something you want in any single fashion editorial. You want somebody who's really good at teasing hair but in the right way in terms of fashion. The same thing, makeup artists. There are awesome makeup artists in the market that are underrated because they have images from photographers that aren't, are subpar, just being very candid. But there are also makeup artists who just generally aren't that good that are saved by post-production. So the other thing is just noting the difference. What's good makeup? What's terrible makeup? What works for me on set? What don't I want? We'll talk about that momentarily as well. Wardrobe stylists, the biggest pains in the behinds that I've ever worked with, very candidly. Here's why because it takes them three to four days to pull clothing to be able to do a shoot. That's three or four days of work to be able to do one specific fashion editorial. While you can pack up your gear two or three hours before or charge your, your batteries overnight, they're spending time going out to stores and if they're just starting off buying things so they can re go return them, or if they're already, let's say, established, they're going out to fashion houses and pulling clothing from fashion houses for your specific editorial. You can't do that in a day. You're doing it two, three, four days in a row. 
the reason I mentioned that they could be a little difficult to work with is because they've spent two or three days to work on that specific initiative, so they're going to try to command the shoot. Because they're going to feel like, I did all this extra work, you're going to do what I want. But it's a team effort. Remember that you're the photographer, you're the person putting your eyes towards the concept. Next, we'll go all the way back through each of these individuals, by the way, but I'm giving you guys more or less what this process is going to be like. Um, how many of you are creating mood boards right now? Can you raise your hands for me? How many of you just can't? This is therapy, very honest and open. How many of you don't know what a mood board is? Raise your hands for me. Awesome, <laughs> love it. A mood board is a collection of images that you can put together to showcase to someone what your idea specifically is. Okay? So if I'm trying to showcase fashion on location in the desert, I can showcase one image that's just the desert, one image of what the model looks like, one image of what the pose is going to look like, one image of what the editing is going to look like, the color, all of that. And I put them together in a specific board to showcase what I'm trying to put together. I'm going to quickly show you guys the easiest way to make that happen. So if you head over to spark.adobe.com, this is absolutely free. Everything that I'm talking to you guys about today is going to be free. I have nothing, again, to sell you guys, but this is something if you're using Photoshop, Lightroom, and all of that, it's a very simple way to get access to those things. Spark.adobe.com is a platform that you guys can utilize to create graphics and faster graphics. So when I'm talking about that, I'm speaking marketing graphics, mood boards, uh, Instagram posts, all of that. You guys can utilize this for your businesses. So spark.adobe.com, by the way, for those of you that are watching online, I am streaming off my cell phone, so it's going to be a little laggy. But they have all these different, different presets that I can use for this specific brand. Ultimately, what I'm looking for once that loads is a little add button to the top, which is going to let me create a mood board. And a mood board, as I search for that, the algorithms, the artificial intelligence that Adobe has in the background, they're going to know what a mood board is. It's going to be able to put, we'll go through this. Let me log in quickly. You shouldn't see my password, but just in case, I'm going to unplug this. I love you guys, but not that much. <laughs> and if I'm speaking way too fast, I'm also from New York City. I speak very, very fast. I know you guys at home or here understand that. Slow me down if you guys need anything whatsoever. There's a lot of information I'm going to cover in the next hour and a half. So let's continue moving that way. It's making me log in through Facebook, really. Why? Why, Spark? Why do you have to have so many steps? By the way, again, this would be so much faster if I was in, on the internet at home. Unfortunately, I'm not. While that's happening, I'm just going to slow this down even further. But while that's happening, let that load. While that's loading, Again, a mood board is a collection of images, so this is going to allow me to create things faster. I don't want to spend time in Illustrator, InDesign, or Photoshop creating and aggregating photos together. I want to find a simple platform to be able to do that. By the way, Adobe Spark has the same tool, not on your PC, directly on your cell phone. So if you guys want to head over to your cell phones now and download Spark Post, that's effectively what I'm, I'm creating right now. So. While that's loading, it has a little plus option at the top, but I want it to completely load so you guys have that. Again, Spark Post on your mobile devices is the same tool that I'm using here. So you can see here, right off the top, I have things I've created already. You can see things that I've produced already. I've created YouTube thumbnails. I've created my posts. I've created um, different mood boards that I put together. And let me show you what a mood board looks like, or a collection of images looks like when this thing decides to open. So a collection of images, I'll, sh I'll choose eight to ten different images that represent more or less what I'm trying to create so I can show to my team, my makeup artist, my hairstylist, my wardrobe stylist, or to an editor, to a publication to pitch an idea. I need to showcase more or less what that idea is physically going to look like. Because if I go, I go to somebody and say, hey, I want to shoot this, they might interpret things differently than what I'm trying to articulate, and therefore the end result is going to look completely different than what I photographed orig or what I had recommended originally. How many of you have worked with somebody that just had a completely different idea than what you had. Can you raise your hands for me? Awesome. This is the way that you can dissect that and make sure that that doesn't happen. So while that's completely loading, and this, as long as you have good internet and you're not streaming it off your phone, can take 30 seconds for you guys to put together. What I want you to do is go to something like Pinterest, save the photos that you guys are trying to put together. So let's say this is like the, mo the model that I want to use. This is more or less what she looks like or he looks like. These are the clothes that I want to use. This is what they look like. Just save those photos. Put them into a specific design here, and then share that with your team. Because when you go to the wardrobe stylist and say, what I'm looking for is business attire that looks like this, and they come in like avant-garde pieces that don't match your original editorial, you can refer them to something. So remember that as well. It's always about the reference to, to a specific uh, mood board. And on the right-hand side, very in very small little areas, you can start seeing other mood boards that have been put together for specific projects before mine loads. 
Does that make sense to everybody? I know I harped on that for a little bit. So if I'm coming up with a concept, I'm coming up with an idea, I want to share that with people, I need to come up with a mood board, a, a guide of different images that I can showcase to people and send that to them. This top right-hand side, if I press download, I can download it as a JPEG, send it off in an email. Everybody has the, the more or less the guide that we're working with for the day. It's almost like the instructions for what we're producing. Okay? It is 2019, three days into 2019. It is very, it is very easy to find a creative team to work with. Here's how many of you are photographers. To, let, me, let me rephrase it. How many of you are not on Instagram? Raise your hand for me. Awesome. Three people. How many of you that are, the three of you are photographers? Can you raise your hand for me? Awesome. The reason I mention that is you're a photographer. Instagram is a social media platform based on what? Images. Why are you not on Instagram? It's like the only social media platform that you should be on. Instagram is a really good platform for you guys to showcase your work and also to find people to work with because it's a direct communication to people. Things aren't hidden anymore. I can find an editor-in-chief to any publication in the United States directly on Instagram. And I can message them. Top right-hand corner, I can go ahead and send, send a message to that person and say, hey, listen, I create this body of work. I would love to work with you. It's, a, it's all about this in 2018 and 2019. I know you're staring here. The point of that was knocking on the door. Knocking on the door really changes the perspective on everything because it allows you to reach out to someone and say, I'm, I'm very interested in working with you. I don't care if that's a magazine. I don't care if it's a makeup artist. I don't care if it's a wardrobe stylist. I don't care if it's other photographers you want to work with. Here's the goal to get anybody to work with you or the, the trick to get anybody work, to work with you. Acknowledge what you love about what they produce. Not just anything. Don't just say, I love your work because we all get that. I love your work, OK? Well, I, I could care less. What do you love about it? Because then it shows attention to detail. You actually care what that person likes. It doesn't, it, or that person produces. It doesn't look like something generic. If you're looking for a makeup artist, I implore you to look up the hashtag makeup artist, M-U-A, and even further, M-U-A-N-Y-C, makeup artist New York City. And I guarantee that you'll find makeup artists that are here in New York City producing content. If you don't have Instagram in 2019, personally, I think that's a, that's a terrible business model to have because that's the direct access to people. But if you want to go real old school, super old school, and I still do this if I'm going to travel to somewhere, I do this. Not knocking on glass, but knocking on the door again. How many of you live in larger cities, even if you live in a smaller city? How many uh, Sephora's are there in the marketplace? How many Mac uh, stores are there in the marketplace? Each of those people, I guarantee, uh, freelances at some point, or freelances for a wedding, or freelances for different projects. Why aren't you reaching out to those people, handing out your business cards to say, I'd love to work with you? Drop in, pretend you're shopping for something. Make interest to, oh my god, I love the way that you did that, that girl's cat eyes, right? They look beautiful. Or you did that, the, the blending that you did was absolutely amazing. I've never seen anything like that. Just out of curiosity, do you freelance? Here's my business card. I'd love to work with you. It's really that easy for you guys to start net networking and finding people to work with. It's not that difficult. I say social media is a little easier because you don't have to get out in the cold if you live here in New York City to go make that <laughs> knock on the door. But if you have to do that, that's a way that you guys can, can physically do that. And just to, to point this, I was just recently in Vegas for a project in uh, the second week of December. I quite literally get off the plane, and as you're getting down the, uh, the flight in Vegas, there's now a makeup station directly as you're at the bottom landing stairs. I walked in there, I grabbed makeup because I need a concealer under my eyes. At the end of a six hour flight, when you have to go into a meeting, that's the easiest way to blend things in. And as I'm talking to the girl, I'm like, she found my makeup super quick like within the first one or two shades. And I'm like, that's amazing. Hey, next time in Vegas, next time I'm in Vegas, I'd love to work with you. Here's my business card. Do you freelance at all? I'd love to work with you. Check me out, Google me. These are the things that I'm producing. It's that easy to find people to work with. Hairstylists, even if you live in the middle of nowhere, I guarantee there's a barber shop or hairstylist somewhere within a 45 minute drive to you that's creating something. Even if they have their own salon, they're still creating images that they need to market their business. Right? Because at the end of the day, it's 2019, people are using images to market their businesses. It's an easy way to make that happen. Does that make sense to everybody? Wardrobe stylist, right? Stylist, ST, you know what? As a matter of fact, hairstylist, if you want to go on Instagram, hashtag stylist NYC for you guys that live in New York City. If you live in Detroit, you guys are watching online, stylist Detroit, stylist Orlando, stylist LA, wherever you live, stylist. And you'll see people who are cut, coloring, uh, doing hair. Right? The other thing, when you're talking about styling, styling hair, you can hashtag styling, so styling for clothes as an example. 
you want to be really, really um, devious, here's the other way that you can do this. By the way, how many of you acknowledge that business is cutthroat? Raise your hands for me. I like you guys. Welcome, my fellow New Yorkers. If you go into any editorial, in any publication, in any L magazine, in any uh, Vanity Fair, in any independent publication, you know what they showcase when they show an image? Credits. The people who shot that. How hard is it to look for those specific people on Instagram and just pull those specific people and, and message, message them directly? There are times where I'll figure out, OK, I can't find a wardrobe stylist in Detroit. I have no idea who to work with. right? Photographer, Detroit. Let me start looking at photographers who are shooting good work. Who are they working with? Can I contact that person directly? Sounds cutthroat, but at the same token, business is business. If you're trying to reach out to these people to do something, that's the easiest way to make that happen. They've already established the right connections and the right leads for you guys to have those conversations. And I do that a lot. If I'm flying somewhere and I don't have a fixer, somebody who's actively know who knows the area, let's say if I go to Dubai and I don't really know anyone, I can easily go, OK, who are the photographers that are creating awesome work in Dubai? OK, who's their creative team? Can I reach out to them directly and message them and say, I'd love to work with you? If I have a commercial project, this is what I'm paying to work with you. Does that make sense to everybody? It's 2019. There's no barriers to entry. Now it's just creating good work and finding the right people to work with you. Models, it's the same thing. If you have really good work, it's that collaboration, that connection with one another. Now, agencies, for those of you that are interested in reaching out to modeling agencies, it's very, very easy. It sounds difficult, but I'm going to give you guys exactly how to make that happen. Shoot good work. That's it. Shoot good work. It doesn't mean to be the most beautiful people in the world, but shoot consistent work. And then the next thing I want you to do is reach out to them to say, listen, write this down. On your phones, anywhere. I want to work with your new faces. Or I want to work with your development models. Write that down for me. Because ultimately, if you're trying to reach out to marketable faces, those are the two names that you need to, to think about. I want to reach out to your new faces, or I want to reach out to your development models. That means women or men who are looking to model but have no portfolio. I have no portfolio to put together, and I have zero dollars and zero cents to make that happen. And what they're going to do is find photographers who have good work for that specific model to go photograph with. They're going to vet you. They're going to figure you out. They're going to ask you to come in for an interview and showcase your portfolio, preferably because, or probably because they don't want to make sure that you're not a creep, right? Because they want to make sure that you guys can get along and there's no issues on the back end. They're protecting their specific staff and the people that work for them. So they're going to ask you to come in for an interview. They're just going to, they're just going to talk to you. They're going to figure you out, know who you are. It's almost like a, a work interview. But then you get to work with people for free because of the first thing that I mentioned in this class, which is what? Value. There, was had, there had to be one person that should have gotten that. Value. Because you're creating something of value. They're looking for a portfolio. You're be able to create the portfolio. You're using their, mo their models to be able to, sh to improve your work and level up your work. They're using those to be able to market and find other brands to work with. And the cool part is when they're putting a comp card together and they're marketing a comp card, so the model is, let's say, using a little pamphlet to be able to showcase to people, this is my work, it'll have your name physically on there. Not your you know, Jeff Rojas Photography LLC, but it'll have photo by Jeff Rojas. So if somebody finds that image, let's say they go to a marketing agency and they love that image, guess what? They can easily Google you and find you. That's the cool part. As you're shooting really good work, it gives you access to other people that are also creating really amazing things. Does everybody see how the world is more accessible in 2019? What if I told you that magazines were the same way? It's 2019. Instagram. Every magazine that's producing content is now on Instagram. You know why? Because it doesn't cost you anything. Do you know how many editorials that are, sh are shown, let's say, on Instagram or online that aren't in print any longer? Most of them. Print is a dying business. Hate me or love me, but print is a dying business. It's just what it is. right? That's where the trend in the market's been going. Therefore, they're trying to create content all the time, or what's called content velocity. They're trying to produce as much content as possible. Why? Because a magazine makes money from what? Advertising. Advertising. The more content that they can showcase, the more clothing they can showcase, the more awesome images that people want to see, the more they make in advertising. So if you can shoot an editorial that a magazine wants to showcase, they're going to go ahead and publish that. If they know that you can create a specific, let's say they know that you have the potential to create an editorial, they're going to fend for you. 
Because in 2018 and 2019, more so than ever, content is king. And they make their money off of content. There's no reason you can't reach out to a magazine now if you have their quality and caliber. You can't shoot, like when you're first picking up your camera, I guarantee you're not going to shoot L. But if you start getting there and you reach out to L Malaysia, not United States, because that's going to take you a while, I guarantee you. But L Malaysia, those are the people that are going to start making connections with you. And very candidly, I've done this. I've shot for L, Sweden. But it's still L, and I can still say I shot for L. Just the subset says Sweden. El Hoboken. Exactly. El Hoboken. I worry about you. <laughs> when I reach out to people and I think about the publications, I've shot for Esquire, Malaysia. But I've shot for Esquire. You know what's the cool part about that? How many of you love shooting portraits? How many of you shoot money, like make money shooting portraits now? Awesome. I guarantee when you go back to your client and say, listen, I shot for El um, Sweden, let's say, or as, uh, let's say Esquire, Malaysia that they're going to go, they're going to tell their friends, I shot with a photographer that shot for L. I shot with a photographer that shot for Esquire, and I'm amazing. Guess what you can do? You can charge for that. You know why? Because you have more perceived, what's that first thing that I mentioned? Value. value. Right? The more perceived value that you have, people ultimately want to work with you guys. That's the concept we're talking about here, value. If you create something of value, agencies want to work with you. If you create something of value, makeup artists want to work with you. If you create something of value, you know, anyone in the marketplace wants to work with you, and then you can start charging for your work because your value supersedes what the market is creating right now. Does that make sense to everybody? If it doesn't, it's therapy, I'll just squint at you. We're good? Okay. Quickly, mood boards is a collection of images that are put together. Now this, for example, let's say if I was trying to showcase, um, I'm trying to submit an editorial. Now very quickly, the difference between submissions and commissions one means that you're submitting work without anybody knowing. Nobody has an idea you created. You just create it on your own, and you want a magazine to say, we love that. Let's, 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 uh, let's publish that. A commission means that the magazine found you. They commissioned you to go do the work, and you showcase what those images look like. With these specific images that I'm creating here, this little layout that I have, this is more for a submission, meaning that I've shot this with a stylist and a, and a, and a model. I have a list of credits, all the clothing that has for that specific shot. I have all the model's name, the makeup artist's name. Um, I have my name on the credits. I have our URLs and our Instagram handles. And I reach out to a publication to say, I'd love, I'd love for this uh, to run in your feature. I think it aligns really well with what you guys are producing. This is more or less what I want you guys to, to, to showcase. Showcase these images to them. It's a low resolution version. They're not high res. And then I'll direct them more or less where those uh, high resolution files can be downloaded. They'll say yes or no. And just very candidly, if you send out this 100 times, you might get one yes. You might get one answer out of 100 times. This has happened to me. I would send that one editorial to 100 different publications and never get a single answer until my work had more perceived value and just was good enough for them to say yes. Who loves hearing the word no? It sucks, right? It's not fun. But the reality is there are people, especially in the fashion industry, that aren't just going to give you an answer. And that's OK. The benefit is maybe the no is because it just doesn't align with what they're producing already. Maybe you didn't think about it, and you photographed a men's editorial for a publication, and they're an entirely women's publication. They're looking at you like, <laughs> maybe you shot with H&M clothing, and they're only producing haute couture, let's say. Right? Those are things to consider. The easiest way to get into a publication, very candidly, is to shoot, if you're submitting work, is to work with a team, produce a concept that they're already creating already. You're aligning with what they're doing already. If it's Esquire, I'm not going to send H&M clothing, because I know Esquire has a specific line of clothing that they'll produce. And I'll do my research. I'll go into the publication. I'll look at it and say, OK, what kind of clothing are they producing? OK, that's 1500 bucks. OK, How, I don't want to put that on my credit card. What's the easiest way to do that? Write this down. And I'm going to give you guys this guide anyway for free. We talked about this before, but we'll go with that. Fashion houses, fashion house. Are, house, are marketing um, agencies for styling brands, or sorry, marketing agencies for clothing brands that are effectively trying to push their clothes into the marketplace. They're the ones that have, when you go to a shop and you see just one specific piece for uh, one specific brand. So let's say this hoodie, there might be just one with a specific uh, size, or it might have two sizes. And usually they'll be double zero or zero, or if they're a guy, they'll be medium because they fit model sizes. Ultimately, those, those clothing, that clothing is used for marketing purposes to push the next season's catalog. 
So a fashion house, any major city will have a fashion house to market their brand. You go to Miami, they'll probably have swimsuits. You go to New York, they definitely have clothing. Uh, let's say running attire, they have. Um, I know Timberland has a couple places here. You have Robert Graham has places here that they'll have uh, fashion houses with. But there are a ton of fashion houses here in New York City to reach out to to say, hey, listen, I have this editorial that I want to photograph. Let's say I'm, I have, um, I want to work with a GQ, and GQ says, yeah, we want to work with you. I can easily have my stylist reach out to that fashion house to say, here's the reference letter that says that we're working together, and I'd love to work and make that happen. Now, here's what I will tell you. Generally speaking, they'll put a deposit on a credit card to make sure you didn't destroy anything. That is not your responsibility. That is the wardrobe stylist's responsibility because they're the one in charge of wardrobe because if they screw up, it's on them, not on you, and it's their job to make that happen. So a good wardrobe stylist understands that. Now, if you want to make that connection, between a fashion house and a publication, what you need is what's called a pull letter. P-U-L-L -L letter, write it down. You're not writing, <laughs> I'm watching. <laughs> pull letter, and a pull letter is a reference letter. It says that that magazine is interested in working with you. They vetted you as a photographer, they vetted the makeup artist, they vetted the models you wanna pull, and they're giving you a pull letter. A, a pull letter is a reference letter to say, we're interested in working with this person. As long as they don't screw up, we'll publish it. That's literally what it says, just in legal jargon. And you take that letter, or your stylist can take that letter, give it to a fashion house and say, can you give me clothing? And they'll say, hmm, that's GQ? Yes, definitely. But if it's like Billy Bob's magazine from Orlando, Florida, with like one person that's looking at it, I guarantee no, no one's going to give you clothing. It has to be sub something of substance. Generally speaking, you have publications, so those of you that are looking to produce your first editorial, I'll give you the, the easiest one you can get into. This isn't because it's bad, this just means that it's, it's not L, it's not Esquire, but this is the easiest one to get into because they're not so um, focused on the brands that you do, but more or less a creative outlet that you have. It's called Elements Magazine, E-L-L-E-M-E-N-T-S. Elements with two L's. Yeah, Elements with two L's, magazine. How many of you are on Instagram right now looking at that? That's where you should be. Follow Elements Magazine. You guys will figure out that publication you could submit your work to. If you're creating something that they'll, they're interested in producing, they'll produce that information for you guys and, and post it on their, their magazine. I think they're mostly digital. If you want to order a print, they have ways of doing that. I have no affiliation to that magazine, but I know it's an easier magazine to have to at least start building up your credibility and saying to your clients, I got published in this magazine. Have you seen it? Is that making sense to everybody? It's not that difficult in 2019 to reach out to these people. As long as you're shooting good work and you're a good person to work with and you're not a prima donna, people want to work with you. People want to work with good people. Okay. Before we start getting to the lighting aspect and things like that, here's the last thing I want to mention. Getting paid for your work. How many of you want to get paid? Uh, there's like three people in here. Like the rest of you, you, can, you guys can work for me. I like this. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be very, very candid. Fashion photography is very difficult to get paid for, just very candidly, because there's so many people interested in creating fashion, and the market is saturated with photographers creating free work, very candidly. Um, I had a friend of mine bid on a job years ago for six figures, and we lost the job because somebody else decided to do it for free. I'll say that again. We lost a job because some, we, we bid on it for six figures, and they were like, that sounds about right. And some, we lost the job because somebody did it for free. They did it for an all-expense-paid vacation in Vegas for a week, including alcohol. But I still could have paid for all that with the six figures because they weren't thinking like business people. You're going to find a lot of those people in the market today. But if you're able to establish that you have, what's that word? Value. Value. You stand out in the marketplace. And here's how you do that. Knocking on those doors. And here's why. Because I guarantee that your photographer who's shooting for free doesn't understand that basic concept. They're just shooting pretty pictures. Guarantee it. But they're not thinking, where is that image going to be utilized? How is that image going to be perceived? I will give you guys exactly how I made a crap ton of money in the last couple of years. Okay? I had a friend of mine reference a marketing agency to me. He goes, listen, I don't shoot men's fashion. You shoot a lot. Let me give you this work. I'll reference you. By the way, pay your people. Make sure you, you comp your people well. If you guys learned anything from the streets of New York City, pay your people well. Those of you from Brooklyn know exactly what I mean. 
if you pay your people well, they'll always find work for you. My friend referenced this job. I said, okay, it's a really good job. I think it was like eight thousand to ten thousand dollars. I said, you know what? You referenced it. Be my assistant. I'll give you half. Now, if you're a photographer, you're like, why are you giving him half? Because he's my assistant and he referenced that job. Without him, I wouldn't have had that job, and without me, he wouldn't have gotten it done. So it's a 50-50 split. We work together to make that happen. I pay my people, guess what? The next time he has a job that he feels unsure about and he references it to me, he knows he's gonna get a 50 cut, and guess what? I get my 50. Just business works like that. You take care of your people, they take care of you. The reason I mention that is I got that job, and as I'm sitting there with the client talking about more or less what we're producing, I realized something, something that they had overlooked. Now, think about what fashion photography is. Fashion photography is a subsection of what? Commercial photography. What is commercial photography? Photography used to sell a product or service, which means what are you trying to do with those specific images? You're trying to sell something, right? So let's say I'm shooting jeans and men's jeans. And it's funny enough, this company is selling men's jeans. And I'm photographing for, the jeans are meant to be marketed to, let's say, um, African-American men. Do you want to photograph a Caucasian male for that specific editorial or that specific advertising? Probably not, right? Because that's not the market that you're trying to reach. Inevitably, that's exactly what happened. They were photographed, their main market was in South America, and they're photographing primarily Asian and American men. Well, guess what? My simple question of, just out of curiosity, by the way, asking questions is thoroughly important. Who's your primary market? South, Amer South American men? Awesome. Uh, so you're using Caucasian men and Asian men. Have you considered just shooting what the people are that are using the clothing? They're like, that's a, that's a good idea, right? And that's what they did. You know what happened to their sales over the next couple months? It starts skyrocketing. Why? Because we inevitably, when we look at something, we make a correlation between that thing and ourselves. So as an example, if you go write this website down, this is the cheat sheet for all of this. Um, Q-U-A-N-T. C A S T, quantcast.com. And Quantcast literally dissects websites. And I'll write, you know what? I'll find it for you guys here. It'll load, it'll take like nine years to load, but it, I'll find it. And Quantcast looks at websites and they say, okay, who's, who's visiting those websites? What demographic do they fit in? How many of you have heard the word demographic? Raise your hand, everybody should raise their hand. What does it mean? What people are looking at websites? What specifically about those people? Age, age, gender, what else? Race, what else? Nationality, what else? Location. Location, what else? Education, income, buying habits, other websites they visited. This website will give you all of that when, it's, when it's, it decides to load. So from here, as an example, I can go to websites, like one of the websites that I frequently visit is called uncrate.com, and I can say, okay, who's looking at that website? Primarily Asian men driving Land Rovers that make over $150,000 a year. That is 70 to 85% of the demographic that looks on that website. So guess what? If I'm shooting for a fashion brand and I want to showcase the right demographic for that specific website, what should I shoot? Asian men. If I want to include a car, what should I include? A Land Rover, right? Not a Volvo. I can start aligning with what they're creating already and what they're interested in already. So when I had that conversation with that brand, they said, we never thought about that. They had 13 brands under their house. You know what they did? We want to hire you as a consultant for the 13 brands. On top of that, we want to hire you to be the photographer for them. So now I'm a marketing director and I'm also a content creator. That's how you make money in 2019. Does that make sense to everybody? If it doesn't, just raise your hand. I'm very honest, and I joke a lot, but by all means, very open book. Um, if this doesn't make sense, I would be more than happy to go over it. I want all of you to feel successful reaching out to people. The point of that is, if you're creating what people want you to create, ultimately has a lot of perceived value for them, they want to hire you. When you can articulate that to people, ultimately they'll hire you to create that specific thing. If you want to shoot for, let's say, men's fashion, sorry, men's uh, gene campaigns, let me be just very clear. That, that specific gene campaign, that first one, wasn't Diesel, it wasn't Levi's. It was a small gene company that's, uh, that's in all the Costco's around the United States. Nobody knows that I shot that, but guess what? I made money off of that, that's how I drove my income, and then I got 13 other th their other brands under that same house. That's how you start making money in 2019. You understand what the client's trying to do, they're trying to sell more jeans with the images that we're trying to create. If I can sell more jeans with the images that we create, 
there's ROI there. So if I'm charging them 10,000, they don't want to make $10,000. They don't want to break even. They want to make 100. So how can I showcase that I'm improving the, the line of sales that they have? That's how you can start making money in 2019. When you can understand that basic concept, that sounds like a lot like business. It doesn't sound like creativity, does it? But you're being creative because you're showcasing what? Value. value. That's what you're going back to. So everything that we're talking about is in accordance with value. Every time you're creating something, it's all about the value that you produce and that the value that you're creating for people. Regardless if you're reaching out to a makeup artist, regardless if you're trying to photograph for a new client, ultimately you have to understand what they're creating, what they're utilizing the images for to able to produce. A magazine makes money off of what? Advertising. So you need to make sure that you're showcasing uh, brands that could spend money advertising. And when you can understand that, and you understand, okay, who spent the most, and you can do this research, who spent the most on advertising in 2018? Okay, this specific brand. Can I reach out to them to pull some clothing for them so I can use it for the publication so ultimately they can go ahead and, and showcase more advertisements specifically for that brand? Because you're already relating to what they're creating already. You're, I guarantee if you think like this, you'll be 10 steps ahead of everyone else that's just creating content. Because if you can articulate that the way that I just articulated to you, you have a lot of perceived value. It's just like the analogy I gave you guys before. If I can impact that dentist's business and justify the investment, he's going to hire me. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll equate it like this. So you have $5 in your pocket, let's say, right? I have 100 in mine. I guarantee you if you give me five, I'll give you 100. Would you give me the five? Hell yeah. Okay? His answer was hell yeah. Okay? If I look at you and say you have $5 in your pocket, I have 100. If you give me the five, I might give you 100. Would you give it to me? If I, if I might have $100 in my pocket, no. why not? Because, because what? You might. I might. What's the difference? It's not a guarantee. I'm not justifying the ROI there. I'm not justifying that he's going to get his, his $100 back. There's no guarantee back there, right? So the conversation when you go to any client is they're going to look at you. They're going to be like, I might make money off of this. I might have an ROI. When you can come back and say, listen, this is how I think it's going to be successful. And this is how we're going to make it happen and you're enforcing the fact that you're able and you're confident about the fact that you can create stuff, guess what? It's going to change their perspective on you. And they're going to hire you to do that project because you have more perceived value. So the project show is a showcase of brands showcasing what clothing they want to showcase for the next season. But what they're showcasing is, let's say Macy's wants to go ahead and have a new line of product they want to showcase. Macy's buyers, the people that buy the clothing to house the clothing within Macy's, We'll scour the place and say, okay, I like, this, I like that piece of clothing. Yeah, we'll give you, you know, give us an order for 100 pairs or 200 pairs or 1,000 pairs or whatever it is for our, our, our store. The project show is exactly that. You can go to the project show and physically see that. The cost of going to the project show is $1,500 for every single person going. If you're cheap, like me, they have the whole contact list for every single booth that'll be there, every single brand that'll be there. The reason I'm going to circle back to you is that you have call center experience. You can create a script to say, I see that you'll be at the project show. Just wanted to make sure that, uh, I just wanted to see if you guys have any content that you guys are producing before the actual show. Because I know that you know, it's, it's necessity for you guys. I know that ultimately it's going to impact the way that buyers are seeing you guys. I want to make sure that you guys have everything ready. If not, I'd love to give you guys my business card. I'd love to work with you. Something around those lines, you create a script, reach out to hundreds of brands directly so you can market directly to them whenever that thing decides to load. So view brand list. Is everybody writing this down? I see one person on their iPad recording it. I like that. How many, how many different brands do we have here? Quite a few. I can go all the way to, let's see, and many, many more. Last update at 1221. Seven for All Mankind, which has shops here in New York City. You can see all these different brands that will physically be at that show. So they're creating content already. What's stopping you from reaching out to them already? Google them, figure out their marketing, uh, their marketing person. And it's as easy as saying this. My name is Jeff Rojas. I'm a commercial and editorial photographer based in New York City. I see that you guys will be at the project show. I just want to make sure that you guys have all the marketing material that you guys are creating. I have a couple clients I photographed already, and I want to make sure that, oh, that are going to be showcasing at the show. And I know it's kind of last minute, but I want to make sure that you guys have everything you need. If not, here's my business card. I'd love to work with you. It literally took me, for one of these clients, 59 seconds to get the marketing director's contact information. 
I counted because I was talking to my stylist, and I was like, why don't you have more work? And he goes, I don't know how to do that. I got you covered, man. I picked up his phone. It took me 59 seconds to get somebody's email. That's what I want you guys to do, to reach out to these people. Does that make sense to everybody? I see a lot of this. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because you're aligning with what? What they value. You're aligning with what they're trying to produce. You're not just saying, I'd love to work with you. Why? What are you creating? You know that this is something that's important to them. They land one major, major vendor that's worth thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to them. So if your image, going back to the conversation about the dentist, can showcase their brand 10 times better, showcase to everyone else what it's going to look like, you know what you have more? Perceived value than anyone else in the marketplace. OK, so let's set this up. First and foremost, I'll show you guys how to set all those things up. We're going to be using a Muslim background to start off with. And let's see what kind of gear that we have. Um, how many, by the way, very openly, I'm not very gear centric. I will use whatever is available to create whatever I need to create. I think as an as a artist, you should have some formal knowledge on how to use anything that's presented to you. So I don't know what I have here, very candidly. But we're going to figure out what we have available to us. We have silk. I assume it's for a beauty dish. We have the beauty dish in here. We have. I'm going to assume this is a Profoto umbrella, deep white. Let's see what size it is. This is the XL. This is the same one that I used for that specific shoot. And let's open this up. OK, how many of you are new to studio lighting? Raise your hands for me. Awesome. I'm going to give you the trick, the cheat. Write this down. Tell me when you guys all have your pens up. It's huge. It is. It is. I, do you know Dave Geffen? At some point, I had a 6 by 4 He was pretending he was a turtle underneath, which is <laughs> funny. And he walked around my studio like that. Um, he's like, he was 40 at the time, which is even funny. I was like, there goes a 40-year-old man pretending he's a turtle under this. Um, when we talk about modifiers and we talk about studio lighting, the idea, there's three ways to work with light. You have available light, or what's called God's light, whatever's around. You have uh, available light that you can modify with ambient light, which is our second one. So if I'm adding light to the scene, so as an example, if all these lights were off, it'd be a very dead day. These are all artificial light that we're adding to the scene to add light to the scene. The last is to create your own light. So you eliminate all the other light that's on set, and you want to create your own light. As a studio photographer, what I'm trying to do is number three. I'm eliminating all the other lights that I have on set, and I'm creating my own light. That's the first thing that I want to do. So I want to make sure that my picture, whatever image I'm taking before I add my strobe light, is black. So no light on set. From there, I can start modifying and creating my own light. Does that make sense to everybody? So my settings for every camera are as follows. Write this down if you're new to studio photography. 1 200th of a second, ISO 100. What didn't I give you? My f-stop, my aperture, right? Because my aperture is going to vary depending on the specific shot and the specific light that I'm going to be using. Because my aperture can vary depending on the power output that I put, depending on the light. So let's look at what we have in here. Are you uh, at 1 200th, so you're under max sync speed? Yes, I am at 1 200th of a second because I am under max sync speed. I know a lot of you have Nikon cameras, Sony cameras, Canon cameras. Every camera is a little different. They generally stick to 1 200th just to keep it flat between all of us, or even between all of us. And next thing, light stand. Light stand, light, power. OK. Anytime you use a light stand, you should make sure that the leg faces your model. Why? Because physics says it'll fall that way, it'll fall that way, but I guarantee it's not going to fall that way. It is cheaper to replace a $1,500 light than fix your model's face. That's it. Okay? And a lawsuit. You don't want a lawsuit. So make sure that everything's nice and tight. I'm going to bring this up to six for right now. Now, my goal is to make sure that my camera triggers with this. Okay, that's the first thing. To do that, it needs to communicate in some way. You have two ways of doing that. You can use old school sync cable, which I'm going to be using today, or you can use a trigger. The trigger that I have is not updated to the camera that I'm using, therefore, I'm not using it. The trigger literally sits on your camera, communicates wirelessly. A sync cable is going to go ahead and go into the port and connect directly to your camera. So what is that called? a sync, S-Y-N-C, cable. 
Oh, it's a Profoto D2. And again, we're not talking about specific, I, I appreciate, by the way, I appreciate Profoto bringing in the gear today for this specific class, and I love them. They're the gear, the, the gear that I use at home. But if you cannot afford Profoto brand, invest in whatever you can use, same concepts apply. We're gonna be talking about what's metered through here. I appreciate these because these have lasted a long, long time, but ultimately that's where it works. This can even fit into an old school film camera. Most film cameras still have a sync cable built in so you can use a flash trigger. So if you're using, let's say Canon A1 from back in the day, you can use this and be able to take that flash. So as long as you're correctly metered, you should be able to trigger this. Next, camera. Next thing, what I have here is a jerk stopper. And a jerk stopper is meant so this cable doesn't pop out. Okay, so that's gonna go in here. As long as it's nice and tight in there. I put this in the camera. As long as it's in the right port. Okay, so as long as I have that right, it shouldn't pop out. It popped out, I know that I have it too short. I will tell you this, if you have somebody on set who is not the most reliable person in the world, this won't pop out your camera, but what's gonna happen if I yank this cord and I have it on a chair or something? The camera's going with it. So just be very careful where you place this, okay? Now, this is not gonna be pretty light. To those of you that are just learning how to use light the first time, this is very directional. What I care is that we're getting correct exposure. By correct exposure, what I mean is not too dark, not too light, just even enough so I have as much information as possible. Ideally, you want to use one of these, which is what we talked about before, a light meter. Yes? What's the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's grab this. So a light meter is gonna check exactly the uh, aperture that we're supposed to use, that f-stop number. So we're at 1 200 we're at ISO of 100. This is gonna say, okay, 1 200th of a second, ISO of 100. It's gonna measure this and say what my camera setting should be. So if I leave my light here, which I'm not going to, and Charles, can I borrow you for a second? Can you hold this? You just hold this light here under her chin. Right there. And perfect. Hold it one more time. Sorry. Right there. One, two, three. Try that again. Sorry. It's being weird on me. Oh, that's why. There we go. Because it's in the menu for some reason. As long as I trigger that off. So this is F8, meaning my aperture should be what? F8. Okay. So I'm going to just have you press that for me. Just the right hand side and just under her chin. Yep. One, two, three. Awesome. F5.6. Okay. I can see that if I use this light and I want to use this light in this specific position to light her at that specific marker, I need to be 1 200th F8, sorry, F5.6 and ISO of 100 to get the correct exposure. I don't like this position because it's ultimately directional. It's not the most flattering light in the world. I want to modify this. I want to showcase that it's a very soft form of light. Do you guys see the light that's emanating on her face? Yeah, it's a very soft form of light. It's not as directional as I have on my, my face here with that main light source, okay? The same thing matters. This light is now facing that direction. It's going through this diffusion material. This diffusion material is called a one stop of diffusion, which means that I, I'm trading softness for one stop of light. So if I was at F8, I'm now at F5.6. If I was at F5.6, I would be at F4. If I was at F4, I'd be at 2.8. So I'm losing a stop of light. I've also moved her closer, which means that I'm gonna have more light on her. So we're gonna see where that balance is. So we're not guessing. What we're gonna do is use a light meter. And the next thing is sandbags. Also, for those of you that are using sandbags, if it is touching the floor, it is not doing its job. Does that make sense? Gravity says it needs to be off the floor. Perfect. This is now F4.7, so F4 and 2 thirds, right? If I raise this slightly, where should we be? 5.6. Perfect. We're at F5.6.2. I'm going to lower it a tiny bit. Perfect. F5.6 even. So if I switch my camera settings to 1 200th, F5.6, ISO 100, what am I going to get? Correct exposure. Okay? See, let's see what happens here. Perfect. So as long as I'm communicating there, it's only like 400 bucks flying in the air. Beautiful. One, two, three. Perfect. Let's see what we have here. I have no idea what it looks like. Where are we so far? You're so pretty. 
I don't mean that in a condescending way. I just mean, you know, I'm a nerd. Just go with that. Let's switch this around. Okay. Almost. I prefer, in this image, for it to add a slight exposure. I want to add just a tiny bit of exposure. So although I'm correctly exposed and the background's correctly exposed, I don't find it traditionally interesting. I would like to eliminate or reduce any imperfect. She doesn't have any, but if she did, I want to reduce or eliminate some of those. So I'm going to add a tiny bit of light. I'm going to add about a stop, oh sorry, a third of a stop above where my correct exposure should be. Let's see what that looks like. Perfect. Thank you, mate. Beautiful. One, two, three, and perfect. See what that looks like? Boop. Gorgeous. I'll tell you what I love, I'll tell you what I don't like. I love this image. However, I'm losing a lot of detail in her clothing, right? I'm losing a lot of details in the blacks. Well, I'm using a light source that's mainly soft directional. If I want to add some uh, detail in those areas, what I can use is something like a reflector. But if I'm alone on set, that's not necessarily the most easy thing to do in the world. Sometimes I want to bounce around light to create soft, very soft, beautiful light. To do that, what I'm going to use is something that stands up on its own. Turn this over. Thank you. I'll give you this. And what I'm using is a V-flat. Now, traditionally, again, what I mentioned before class, a V-flat is an 8-foot by 4-foot uh, piece of material that sits high. It's very difficult to transport. V-flat world is kind enough to, not kind enough, but they were innovative enough to create something that is both uh, easy to transport and easy to put together. So each of these pieces, so if I look here, each of these pieces will flip up. And once again, I can do this, as long as I'm not trying to hit anybody. Listen, you can't sue me if I knock you in the head by accident. Promise? <laughs> I like it. He's like, yep, yes, we can. Are you from Brooklyn? You're part of my neighborhood. White is going to do what to my light? It's going to reflect back to my subject. What should happen if I put this on her right side and her left side? What kind of light am I going to have? Am I going to have a, a softer light or am I going to have a harsh light? Soft. Awesome. Let's see what that does. Let's put it on her left, and then we're going to put it on her right. And if you can't see, I'm sorry. You know, what, you know why I did it over here, right? Because nobody wants to see your face. <laughs> Can you stand, that, stand there for me? Same place that you were? OK. Let's see what happens if I just use the left. That's, that was karma. Did you see that? <laughs> Beautiful. And two, three, and perfect. See what that looks like? Beautiful. OK. What if I switched? One, two. How many, how many things have I switched? Have I changed my, sem my settings on my camera? No. Have I changed the distance between my subject and the light? No. She's still the exact same spot that she was before. I added a V-flat, and what did it do to the image? It softened the light source. It brought in some light just under her chin. If I add another light on the right-hand side, and you can see I'm starting to get more information just in the blacks here. If I added another light on the right-hand side, what would happen? More of the same. I don't have a very pretty background. What color is that background? Gray. Gray. It's not very interesting. So let's say I wanted something to create. Guess what I can do? I can take this away. Boop. I'm going to have you step where I am here just quickly. Sorry. Thank you, Kelly. Stay there. Don't move. Not you. The... <laughs> Grab this. Boop. What's going to happen? Am I going to have a gray background? Okay, I'm going to have you stand there for me. Thank you. What color is my background going to be? White. So, let's see it. One, two, three. Perfect. One, two, three. And perfect. Last one. Gorgeous. One, two, three. Perfect. And I lied about the last one. <laughs> two, three. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. That's the point. Perfect. What color is our background? White. White. Why? It's a closer, closer to the subject which means that more light is falling in the background. And also, it's not gray or a, a beige color. It's also completely white. And it's reflecting some of that surface back. 
in addition, so just to show you guys this, that light bouncing back is doing what on the sides of the face? It's starting to pull, uh, sorry, it's starting to reflect some of the information that she has here. If I want to reduce or eliminate that, how do I do it? Add the negative fill. So let's do that. Boop. More time. I'm trying not to lose an eye on this thing. One, two, three. perfect. Two, three, gorgeous, and perfect. Last one. One, two, three, perfect. Love it. Sure, that's what I need. Beautiful. What fell? What broke? <laughs> We're good. We're golden. Perfect. Okay. Do we have a lot less light than we had before on that right hand side? Oop. Let's look. One, two. Do you guys start to see some of the negative space that's coming inside here? Because we're eliminating some of the light. We're using black to absorb light and pull out light out of that information there. If I wanted an all black background, I can use it as an all black background. We can switch that out. Now, what's going to happen to that reflective light that's happening under her, I mean, around her cheekbones? It's going to disappear. What else is going to happen? I'm going to show you guys how to use a single B flat to create a black background and pull some of those cheekbones. Very, very simply. Move this over. I'm going to have you step towards me for a second. Right there. Beautiful. Again, when I said beautiful, I meant this. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm, I, listen, I grew up with a ton of girls. It's just funny to do that to you guys. It brings, it brings all the, the men that call you beautiful in the world, and it's like, here's this one guy who's just a mean person. Let's go this way. And can you stand in there for me? What's going to happen? Can you guys explain? Negative fill? What else? What color is my background going to be? Black. 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 Let's look at that. Boop. Beautiful. And one, two, three. Perfect. Stay there for me. One, two, three. Perfect. Last one. Beautiful. Let's see what that looks like. Beautiful. Beautiful. However, what's happening to my light? What does black do? It absorbs light. How does my overall light look in the, the image compared to what it looked like before? It looks darker, right? It looks underexposed. One, two. Because all that black light is moving around. Sorry, it's, it's pulling all the light that's there. So what do I need to do in order to keep the equivalent exposure for what we, what we had before? increase the amount of light that we have. You can bring it in for me right about there. And I brought the light in closer, which is going to do what? Soften. It's going to soften, but what is, all, what is it going to do to overall light? It's going to add overall light, right? Because I've moved it slightly. Let's see what's happening here. One, two, three. Beautiful. Awesome. Gorgeous. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Perfect. Beautiful. How much light did I add? Did I change my power settings at all? What did I do? I just moved it over slightly to her, which is increasing the, sorry, it's decreasing the distance between my subject and the light source, which is going to increase the amount of light that I have on my subject, which means I have a slightly overexposed image, right? <coughs> if I turn this this way, boop, can we see that a lot of that information is getting lost? So I'm going to do that same thing. What am I going to do in order to get the correct exposure? I'm going to turn that down. Let's do that again. OK. You can see the cheekbones. You can see her jawline. I would prefer something like that. And then I don't have to sit there and fix all the graduation in the background as well. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. So we switched that from being an all black background to an all white background. We added two white uh, B-flats on either side. Let's move this around some. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to use a beauty dish. How many of you own a beauty dish at home? Awesome. One person. How many of you are interested in buying a beauty dish? How many of you, at some point, how many of you have no idea what a beauty dish is? I like that answer. Let's do that. OK. How much do these cost? Divi, how much do they cost? 195. 195. 195. Are they in stock? I'm going to have you step over for a second. Are they in stock here? They are in stock. OK. Divi has all the answers. For those of you that are watching on online, it's 195. 
But it can be. Oh, I like it. Two for three seventy. I like it. I remember this kid back in high school selling CDs, and he used to go one for ten, two for twenty. That was his deal. <laughs> Sounds kind of like that to me. I'm joking. One for ten, two for twenty. Okay. Does everybody get that? We have. So, by the way, the meter reading was originally what? Five six. Five six. Okay. And we have. I would say about three feet from our subject. So you want it at five six, and we're going to get to where we were right here. Does everybody have that meter reading down? How many of you do not own a light meter? Raise your hand. They're like a hundred bucks. When you have a hundred dollars to your name, go buy one. I cannot tell you enough that you need one of these, especially if you're using light and you want to replicate things. Picture uh, cake cooking in the kitchen, and you cook this amazing lasagna that you've never cooked before, and then you try it again and you can't do it. That's what it's like not having a light meter on set. You want to make sure you have it so you can replicate everything that you did before. Because if not, you're going to go back and you're going to try the same thing, and it's never going to feel the same. Measure your distance, measure the light meter reading, measure everything as it's happening. Does that make sense to everybody? Look up Greg Heisler. If you haven't seen his work already, Greg has been, he shot GQ, Esquire, every, and real GQ, like not like GQ, Timbuktu, in regards to being able to do stuff. He has uh, note cards of every single shoot he's ever done since the 80s to be able to replicate things. I recommend doing that, just not note cards, digitally, somewhere safe and safe. Okay, goodie dishes are these things. A beauty dish is, for all intents and purposes, and Pro Photo calls there's a soft light reflector. So what that does is the light goes in here, right through here, hits this thing, bounces back here, and spreads back out. So it's hitting once, expanding its size back out here, and then expanding again even further back out to our subjects. Oh, now we have delinquents in class. How are you? We're friends. It, it, like, now you know when I like somebody, I make fun of you because that's the family I grew up in. How many of you grew up in families like that? Can you raise your hands for me? We can be friends. Because if not, I just sound obnoxious all the time. I mean, I still sound obnoxious all the time, but OK. Look at the type of light that we have. As I move that around, what do we see that's happening in the center of my light? Shadow. We have that shadow. Where's the shadow coming from? The center. the center, right? So if I use that directly at my subject, the light should wrap around, but I also could have a dark spot depending on the area. I prefer, personally, to use the feather of the light around here, not the center of the light. You'll find photographers who love using that center of the light and using that, that light source to hit down at your subject. I find that using it slightly off to the side creates a, a softer form of light, and we're going to see what that does. Let me go ahead and tilt this down. Boop. And bring this up. Boop. Now, if I want to measure this and I want to get the correct setting the first time around, what should I use? Light meter. I'm not going to use one specifically, just to show you guys the difference between the two for right now. Okay? What have I switched in terms of um, height and size? I've switched my modifier. I haven't switched my camera settings, and I haven't switched my power settings. It's around the same height that I had before, if given the, the same approximate light. So I'm going to have you stand there again. Let's look at what's happening. Can you guys guess for me, am I going to have an image that's slightly overexposed or slightly underexposed? Raise your hand if it's over. Raise your hand if it's under. Everybody got $5 in them, right? Those of you that lost, OK, let's do this. And one, two, three. Perfect. Let's see what that looks like. Boop. How many of you guessed the same? I didn't give that as an option. Why? By the way, if we look at that light source, is it softer or harsher than what we had before? So one. Oh, we'll go from here. One. Makes it easier if I just turn this thing. One to two. It's harsher, right? Which means I can see what? Blemishes. Is that the most flattering thing to have on a subject? No. no. Right? That's not what I want. I want, to, I want to make sure that I'm able to eliminate some of those. Therefore, what I'm going to use is to 
if I can use this. Nope, not there. Ha! What am I gonna use? Diffusion material. What's diffusion material gonna do? By the way, this is gonna pop me in my face at least once. <laughs> Guarantee it. This is like giving somebody a wedgie over and over and over again. Thank you. You got that? Can you tell I was mean back in middle school? I'm still mean, but let's go. Perfect. We almost had it. We almost had it. It was like super effort there. How many photographers does it take to put on a diffusion material on a beauty dish? It's going to be the whole class just holding it. I'm just going to hold this. You got it? Okay, I'm going to move my fingers this way. Stay there. Stay there. Can I get a round of applause, please? Thank you. You did amazing. You did amazing. Okay. That's a one stop of thank you. <laughs> it's a one stop of beauty. Uh, one stop of diffusion material. What is that going to do? One stop, right? So what that should that image look like? Softer and a little darker. Let's see what it looks like. And one, two, three. Perfect. It is. Boop. Two. So one, two. So ideally, it should have been darker. Why? I like this. What's it doing to the light source? Hmm? It's what? Do we switch anything? So what happened? So this is when we start isolating things. We're going to look at my camera that still says F8, uh, I mean F63 at 1 200th at F, uh, sorry, at ISO of 100. So we haven't switched anything from the last shot. We just have a ton more light. So if we look at this, is it, is it concentrating light? Maybe now that it has a diffusion, or is it supposed to be shred spreading things out? Hmm? Spreading. spreading things out, which means that I should have less light. So something happened in between these two. So as a photographer, I'm still baffled by this whole thing. <laughs> Have a step forward for me. We're going, to we're going to lower that power of light. Ultimately, something happened with this trigger. And this is what I'm saying. You, you should know more or less what this is going to look like every single time. That should not have happened. Something happened between my camera, the trigger, and the light source. Right? If I was looking at something, something changed. I don't know if it was in my camera. And I could look through camera settings to see one and back and forth one. So one, see what this is looking like. So one, two, see the settings. I don't feel like going through edit mode here, but we're going to look. Ah, just go to viewer. We'll figure that out afterwards. So for right now, I'm going to leave this as preview mode. Um, we should have less light. What I feel that happened in between this is as we put that light source on, because her face was in the dark spot, we're now uh, focusing that light better, and it's now wrapping around. So remember, hmm? so before I had it directly in the middle, I was going to turn it to the side, but I want to show the difference in light. I think what happened is that her face was directly in the shadow when we first took the first shot. Remember I mentioned I generally don't do that? And as we put the diffusion material, it wrapped around the shadow, and now we have more light. I'm going to say that that's probably what winded up happening. And again, by the way, if you guys don't know this, you guys are effectively physicists at this point, because that's what photography is. It's effectively all physics and light. No one told you that, by the way. But that's if you like math, welcome. If you don't like math, welcome. OK. So I'm going to lower my power of light from where I was before. And oh, that's what happened. This thing is frozen. I'm going to turn this off and turn it back on. Sorry. It could have been. Turn on again. Okay, close your eyes for me for a second, darling. Perfect. Let's try that again. Perfect. And one more time, just to just check out the synopsis. Perfect. Beautiful. I'm gonna guarantee here's what winds up happening. It wrapped around the beauty dish. The dark spot that we had originally was on her face, and because we used that diffusion material, it wrapped around and added more light to the scene. If I look back at the light that we had before, as I mentioned, and and this is how we can tell. Light on the background. One, two. One, two. Do you notice the light on the background is approximately the same? The difference is the light on her face. 
So what winds up happening is her face is in that dark spot. Because we used a diffusion material, as I mentioned before, it wrapped around, it softened that light source, and it's softening directly on her face. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So as we did that, we also turned that back on. We have the same approximate light that we had before. But I'm also losing about a stop of light. I want to add some light to that scene. So let's go up to about 6.7. We were at 6.3 before. Beautiful. Perfect. And one, two, three. Perfect. Beautiful. Let's see what that looks like. Awesome. Now, there's still a lot of contrast to that photo. If I wanted to lessen the amount of contrast or this little shadow area, the smaller the light source is compared to my subject, the harsher it's going to be, right? So I have it very far away from her. How do I soften that light without changing a modifier? Move her closer. So I'm going to move this closer. Let's move this in directly at you. Where should my leg be positioned? Right at her. At her. What happens if it's not? Lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. See, now you can't sue me because I said that. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Gorgeous. Can I borrow the light meter? Where are we going to put this? Right under her chin. Under her chin. So do you always keep the down diffused or anything? So the diffusion, this little piece here, yeah, is for overall okay. exposure. I generally will keep this under if I'm using multiple lights on set. Generally speaking, for one, you'd have this. But if I have two or three lights on set and I want to measure each one, it goes back in. So for this, it really depends. I mean, I have one light. It doesn't really matter. One, two, three. Eleven. That's how much of a difference I made. 11.8, actually. So if I move up a tiny bit, what should it be? Sixteen. Thirteen doesn't count. I mean, it does, but not really. It's not a full stop. So we're at F16. So what should my cam camera be set at? F16, ISO, 200th of a second. So let's set that camera setting. And 200th, F16, beautiful. And let's see what that looks like. One. Perfect. It would help if this actually like, plugged in. Is that again? One, two, three. Perfect. 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 Beautiful. Let's see what those look like. Now they are slightly underexposed. Why? Because it's taking overall ambient exposure for every single thing that's happening with that light. I can also, as a visual creative, look at this and say, OK, if I was using Lightroom, I would have the uh, histogram in the top right-hand side. I would see what was happening in that specific image. I know that it's slightly underexposed, probably by about a stop and a half. Okay? What are ways that I can change without having to switch my light source and make sure that that's slightly overexposed? What variable can I change to make sure I'm getting more light to the, the photo? I can increase the light. Or I can? What's the easiest way to do that? You can change my aperture. Probably the easiest way to switch anything on set. Slightly under, underexposed, just open up that aperture. Let's go a stop, and then we're going to go two stops. So I'm at 16. What's one stop? 11. And then what's two stops? 8. OK. So let's go 11, and let's go 8. So I'm going to 11 now. Perfect. And then we'll go to 8. Perfect, 11. And then if I went to 8, theoretically speaking, hypothetically speaking, I'm going to go back to 11 now. Uh -huh. Perfect. Overexposed, right? So let's do this. A couple shots that way. Gorgeous. Molly face. Beautiful. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Love that. And perfect. Last one. Gorgeous. Perfect. Gorgeous. OK. What type of light do we have? We have a much softer light source than we had before, right? Or amount of light that we have. However, because of the size of the light source, what's happening to these areas around here? It's still softer than we had before, sorry, smaller than we had before, so we're still seeing some imperfections in the skin. 
So these are things to consider as you're selecting modifiers. Do I want to use something that's large and soft? Do I want to use something that has more contrast and shows more cheekbones, more jawline? So as an example, if I took this, I'm going to take the white B flat out from okay. behind you. Do you want to stay in the same spot for me? If I took this out completely, and stay there, I take this same shot, what's going to happen to those cheekbones? Less light, but they're not being filtered. Like it. Like that answer. Yeah. Why am I going all the way over there? <laughs> I'm going to do that again. Two, three. Perfect. Perfect. Boop. Boop. What happened? There's just no light bouncing around. So now we're getting to see the real quality of light that we have. So if I wanted to make sure that this was correctly exposed, what I can do for my subject is at 11, it's correctly exposed for her skin. But I want to add some light onto either side of her cheekbones. I don't like how dark it is. How can I do that? Giant V-flat. See that? I'm going to grab one of these. Put it here. I'm glad that everybody knows that I'm not the most uh, stable person in the world in terms of putting things together. I'm kind of a klutz. Come on, you can do this. Thank you, ma'am. You are so helpful. <laughs> We're paying you twice, right? One for assistance and one for being here. Okay, if you want to stand there for me, just in the sit inside, I'll make sure that you don't get knocked out by this. Right there. So what's going to happen now? Can anyone explain that one? It's going to be light filling in on those sides. And then if we want to reduce, say if it's too bright, how do we reduce the amount of light that's hitting those? We just can move them back, move them wider away from our subject. So let's see what's happening there. Beautiful, one, two, three, perfect, gorgeous, and perfect. I'm going to have you step over slightly to your left, right there, beautiful, thank you. Perfect, 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 beautiful. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Do not die. <laughs> I heard something moving. Thank you, thank you. Perfect. Let's see what's happening between those two. One. Two. One. Two. Not only is it bouncing around at our subject, what is it doing to the background? It's kind of like playing pool or playing billiards. The light source is hitting those, and it's still bouncing behind her. It's still wrapping around. It's also hitting our background. So not only am I affecting the light on her, I'm also affecting the light on the background. So it's bouncing around. So you can create different light sources depending on what you're trying to create. If I wanted to introduce an all-white background, let's say, and I can do the same thing that we did before. I can use that as a, as a white background. However, if I want to add some negative fill, I can add negative fill on the left side or right side, depending on what, what I'm trying to produce. Each of these has a different variation to it. What I want to do for the next shot is add a white background, maybe add some white um, halos around the side. How do I do that? We did it before. Well, we can use the V flat, the white V flat, directly behind her, close, so we can create some of those little uh, rim lights around her face. So let's do that. See what that looks like. I'm just going to do this. Just for the intent, I'm just going to move this over. One, two, three, and don't die, Charles. Oh, is that what that is? Okay, stay there, and okay. Awesome. Perfect. Can you? Stand there for mm -hmm. me again. Thank you. Beautiful. See what that looks like. And is she closer or farther away than she was before? I'd probably a little further away. You're okay. Right there. Beautiful. Awesome. Gorgeous. One, two, three. Awesome. See what that looks like? Bam. Do we have our all white background? Mm -hmm. Do we have nice little, well, if she pulled her hair back, would well, we have those little nice little rim lights on the side? So let's see what that looks like. Doop. If I wanted to add more light onto the left side, I can use another V flat. I can use a reflector. I can make that that differentiation there. Can I just have you pull your hair back on that yeah. side slightly? On your this side is fine. Just on that side, just so I can show you cheekbone. Okay. You know. Thank you. Gorgeous. One, two, three. Perfect. Perfect. Stay there. 
and perfect. Perfect. How's that looking? Gorgeous. I have no idea, just because it's tethering there. I'm just taking shots and wishing for the best, so you guys know that, being honest. Boop. So we have that nice little rim light on there. It's showcasing our draw line. Very simple way to make that happen, right? We went through using a V-flat as a background and using our main light that way, using two on either side, using a white V-flat white v as our background, using two on either side, using the beauty edition. A couple of, I think we went, how many different setups did we do? About six within that. I want to make sure that you guys have something. This is really good for like, fashion beauty. If I want to shoot something that's more full length, let's say I'm going to bring this back to 28, Oop, or even 35, see what that looks like. So this is going to be more full length. Uh, probably right around your, right there. Perfect. Perfect. Let's see what that does for light. Boop. Awesome. Try not to trip and die. <laughs> so if I had an all-white background, I can light her from the top of her head down to the middle of her body. Ideally, I would shoot her where she doesn't have any lens distortion, more or less center. If I wanted to add light to the scene, I can use a white V-flat on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side to bring in light again. I can move that light slightly down. I would prefer to use a larger light source on set to light from the top of her head down to the middle of her body, but I would use the umbrella that I had before to make that happen. Does that make sense to everybody? We have two minutes left. I went through seven different lighting setups that we can do, six or seven different lighting setups that we can use. Do you guys feel like you can do this at home? I didn't use nine lights. I used one and walked through different variations of the same thing so you guys can feel comfortable doing that. I went to my first workshop and the lady used eight lights on set. And I was like, uh, I want you guys to go home and be able to say, OK, he used an umbrella. That's cheap. I'm going to go buy one. Right? He used V-flats. I like that because that's something I can use as background. I can use it as fill light. I don't have to have many people on set. I can use that with one light and be happy. And I can create a whole set. I guarantee that if you shot stuff like this and you found a really good retoucher that shows really good skin, that you'll start shooting for fashion publications. Because it's, it, and you have a beautiful model, obviously. You don't want to put, I love grandma, but you don't want grandma in the photograph. You want a beautiful model that you're able to photograph to be in those beauty publications. Are we good? Does everybody have any, okay. I love you guys, but we have to end this class. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for being a part of this class. Thank you, V Flat World and DNA.